I'm going to talk about the life of a CVE and understanding the project's release cycle. Um, they're two very intertwined things. I'm James Strong from ChainGuard. My name is Dylan Turnbull, and I'm a developer advocate for MetaNexus. <clears throat> That's me, uh, Solutions Architect at ChainGuard, which just means I help customers secure their software supply chains using SIG Store, Policy Controller, a bunch of other really cool tools, um, Salsa, at, you know, um, reports, things like that. I'm also a maintainer. I probably just copied and pasted this from other talks, so obviously I'm a maintainer. I'm talking at the maintainer track. <laughs> I'm also an author of Networking and Kubernetes, uh, a, a Cloud Guru instructor on the same one, and a uh, Gemli cosplay enthusiast. As I said, I'm a developer advocate and kind of I'm a hybrid role, also a solutions architect. So I actually work for Nginx proper, and um, I'm on the community. So the mandate of that team is basically to work with folks like James and the rest of the community. All of my job focuses uh, on open source projects and open source contributors. I'm, my, my primary partnership for the architect side is the Rancher uh, project. Um, I also co-host uh, the Engine Room with, uh, with Alessandro here. Uh, that'll be, that might be on later today. Um, I do a couple other things, game development, I, I also do cameras for something where we fly spaceships for an for a esports organization called Admiral Esports, and I am very curious to see what James is doing now with something. I should have wore it. I know. <clears throat> so our agenda, we're going to do a, a CVE review. Um, we're going to go through an actual CVE, um, the timeline, everything that happens behind the scenes. One of the things I wanted to talk about with this is just show you all that there are lots of other things that we're doing than, besides not approving your PRs. So, um, Nginx uh, core CVE remediation. We're actually going to see what happens when Nginx gets a uh, CVE, which probably is a little bit more impactful, I would say, than Ingress getting one. And then we're going to go through the uh, release process. Um, we can go in depth as much time as we have, so you guys can see what happens when, uh, when I break your clusters. But first we're going to talk about a little bit about how Nginx is configured, um, Ingress Nginx is configured. So we've got about 118 annotations that we support, and we've actually um, been working through and going through and making sure that they all have um, documentation, they all have end-to-end -end tests, and a new thing that you're going to see coming out very soon is validations. So you see that um, from a uh, annotation perspective, this is a configuration snippet, so being able to update the Nginx config and controlling it through the annotation. So there's two ways to do that. It's the annotation and then a configuration option. So if you want to make um, changes globally to a um, to Nginx, you can do that with a config map. So you want to set up things like the proxy connect timeout. So if it's not covered in an annotation, you can make sure it's covered in a configuration option. So that's how we kind of get um, the best of both worlds to be able to configure those. So annotations you can do per ingress. The configuration options are um, globally for all of them. So that's how we uh, get through that. But that sets us up for um, the CV that we're going to talk about. So I wanted to make sure that most folks, uh, if you're not using it, you know how it's being used. So let's talk about what happens when we, uh, when we get a CVE and just walk through that whole process. So uh, we do this in concert with the Kubernetes Security Response Committee. I think that's what the SRC stands for. Thank you, Carlos. He's not in his head. So the CVE that we're going to talk about, we got the report last year in July. So it's the Hacker One report. Somebody submitted it to the Kubernetes Hacker Report Hacker One team, and this is what the report looked like. So there's a lot on here on this page, but the the piece that was important that we weren't aware of that could happen is that right here somebody could mount the uh, access token and you could request that. So that's the uh, access token that has access to all of your TLS secrets on your Kubernetes, on, your, uh, on all of your ingresses. So that was a problem. Um, so somebody reported that and uh, we went through and walked through how we're going to fix, how we fix that. 
Um, so it took it takes some time, right? The SRC is also a volunteer organ, uh, volunteer basis. So they got it, they verified it, they know that it was a reproducible vulnerability in August, and they let us know around September. Um, they probably emailed us sooner, and I just didn't see it because I get 200 um, GitHub notifications, and everything goes to a, a label called Ingress. Um, we got a nice email from CJ. He's great. He works with us on the SC, SRC team. There's about five, four or five members. Um, I've got a link in here that um, says who who's all on the SRC and um, their whole processes. So Ricardo put together a remediation. Ricardo's one of the other um, maintainers. He's not able to be here with us. He's here with us in spirit. And uh, we put together that release uh, mitigation and the 101 release. I have a nice little picture of his face. Um, so a lot of the times when we put PRs in and we uh, accidentally break things or we're trying to put new things out there, it possibly is because we're trying to fix a CVE that we haven't released yet. Um, so October 29th, they released a CVE. We have the fix in place. We've notified um, the distributors of that. And um, we'll let you all know. Um, from a CVE reporting perspective, again, I talked about the SRC team. Those are the folks who are working behind the scenes that when a report gets emailed in um, from the reporting. So these are all links to all of this to understand um, a little bit more in depth how that works. That was a very quick overview. Um, and then we have that all in the uh, NGINX security reporting uh, to be able to report a vulnerability. But, um, very quick, high-level overview. There's a lot of back and forth conversations about is this an actual vulnerability, even after they validated it, and working through um, does the fix actually fix um, what was reported. With that, that was a very quick overview. But I want to talk about, I, I saw this the other day when I was reading, I think it was about securing um, software builds, and somebody was talking about if you let people run arbitrary code, arbitrary code is going to be able to be ran. That was a perfectly valid configuration option for a snippet. Like, there's n absolutely nothing wrong with that. So one of the things from the validator's perspective is we're going to try to look at um, understanding what folks are trying to serve up. So obviously nobody should be serving up the service account token. Um, there are other things that we're trying to remediate that, you know, like I said, there's 168 configuration options and all of that. So trying to make sure that you a user is doing the right thing is very difficult because we allow folks to run arbitrary code. You can inject Lua code in there. Um, it's just, it's really hard to do. So allowing people to run arbitrary code, it's part of it's gonna be on the Ingress administrator, part of it's also on us, and it's uh, just something that we have to continue to work on. So when I saw that, I was like, it's set up properly to do that, but there are some protections that we need to put in place to help work through that, so. Um, and then the other thing, OWASP was right. One of the things that we don't do, and one of the reasons why we're putting the validators in place, is that we don't validate user input. So how many people know about the emission webhook that we also use? It just validates the ingress configuration to make sure that it's a valid ingress object before it tries to do before it applies it because you have to do a reload and you know lots of things can happen so we want to make sure that's a valid ingress object but we don't actually we're just looking at does does this actually work but we're not looking at what's inside that we're not validating what the user is trying to do so you know, making sure that they're not trying to mount the token or doing other nefarious things that they shouldn't be like. Know, talking across namespaces, looking at things they don't have access to. So um, we're trying to work on validating more of that user input. So from an annotations and a configuration map perspective, that's why we're putting that in place for the validator. Um, that, should, um, that should drop pretty soon. I think the PR is out there. We're just working through all of the end-to-end -end tests because you know, we're doing this from scratch, 168 um, things. We've already seen that there's end-to-end -end tests and documentation missing on these things. So it's actually going to be really helpful, I think, from that perspective. And then with that, we'll go ahead and do the, uh, we'll go ahead and talk with the CVE remediation. All right, so, um, I'm going to cover Nginx core remediation and at a really, really high level. So I sat with the, the core PM, uh, Nina Forsyth. Um, she said it was fine to give you guys her email address, but instead I'm going to just recommend you kind of 
come on to uh, the GitHub repo, hit up James or I, or get on the Slack channel in Kubernetes and go through me, and then I'll get whatever you want. Uh, any 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 questions you might have for Nina in this regard? But basically, the way the way our process works is we'll get uh, we'll get a submission from something like a researcher, and they'll come to us with the CVE. And uh, we'll take the information that they have, and then we validate it by putting through it a set of, uh, putting it through a set of like you know tests. We all get in a room, we kind of argue over what is and what is correct, what the the threat vectors might be. Some of the things that also happen during this process is we we first we're we're just we're trying to decide is this or is this not a vulnerability. It, it obviously is almost always a vulnerability, but is it mainstream or not mainstream? So the big differential there is that sometimes we'll get vulnerabilities that are that are very the use case is very small. So they're super they're 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 edge cases. They're very limited. So some of those we just kind of say, okay, this is more academic in nature. So we we, we kind of put those in the this is nice to know, but we're not going to do anything to fix those. But um, um, in other instances, uh, the ones that and make it to public. We'll find out that those are legit vulnerabilities. Those get published. We work with the researcher to to establish, you know, how we want to do this. Then, then that the the next process is the information about that vulnerability goes into what's called an embargo. And basically, the embargo is is we work out with the the researcher and the reporter uh, what types of information can we relay, what can we send out to the public, what do we basically need to keep uh, keep under wraps. So that ultimately, when this does hit prime time, the researcher who makes their bread and butter off of finding and, and writing about these things can get the credit for the discovery process. There's no real money that the, there's no money that exchanges hands. It's all basically a credibility-based industry. Um, so the next part of the process is essentially we've qualified it for mainstream. Its feasibility is deemed an actual threat, and then we basically go through the process of looking at further edge cases. So in some cases, we'll get a vulnerability. It'll come as one vulnerability. And then after we've done a bunch of research on it, we'll figure out, well, this is there's actually three vulnerabilities. So we'll basically publish additional CVEs to cover the additional threat vectors um, that occur there. Um, this is also the point at which we kind of sort of decide how are we going to fix this? What is that release process going to look like when we do fix it? And you know, how do we want to go about the next steps? That process in total generally cut, takes it roughly around two weeks. So it can be anywhere from three to seven days of just debating about you know what uh, the stuff that we just talked about, and then there'll be uh, a, a, a point, a part of that week where we're kind of figuring, okay, how do we want to do this? And then there's like two weeks of actual code. Generally, we'll get something out. Um, so this is when the next step of the process we start working on the bits to to publish the remediation, which quite often comes in the form of a patch. And when I'm talking about core, I probably should have uh, qualified what that means. That means Nginx proper. So you go to nginx.org, you got the list of builds that are up there. That's Nginx core. So while it is the it is the the upstream or the progenitor for what happens in the Ingress SIG, it also is um, used in Vial of the distros for for uh, building distro packaging and a whole bunch of other things. So this. This uh, the, when we get a CV, it not only affects Ingress, it affects literally the 1.7 million use cases out there that use Nginx. So we're incredibly tight-lipped um, and careful about how we fix things because obviously one one minor mistake and you have you know you know 20 million websites that all of a sudden are not are losing money. So we, we really don't want to do that. Um, so. Um, once that's decided, it's around two weeks of actual code, and then by the 30th day, we're usually looking at cutting a patch. Um, that's that'll go out, and you know, uh, during that time, we'll notify the the the, the reporter. We'll f we'll lift the embargo. Uh, folks like James will get um, information. Actually, d right around that time uh, is when anybody who ha is an interested party. Um, is able to get the information. Now, when I say get the information, we don't have like a proactive notification that goes out with the exception of the list of PGP encrypted email um, uh, members that are a part of the original uh, cert submission. Um, now, this is something that we've kind of looked at as how can we make this, how can we shortcut that process to make things faster for James and the Ingress SIG as well as distros and their packaging and on and on and on because Obviously, the quicker we can get that out to the universe, 
Anybody who's done their fair share of coding in here understands that busy polling is a wholly inefficient way to do anything. So proactively notifying people when that's available, that's something we're kind of working out the details on, so that's something we could look forward to in the future. And then <coughs> 90 days is kind of this industry standard. Almost never do we go beyond the 90 day, but this is, this is, the, this is what's considered the standardized patch cycle. A lot of this is around enterprise grade stuff, um, because most people will only roll patches on a 90-day cycle, so um, some of this uh, uh, pertains to our uh, the Plus product and uh, products that are enterprise grade. But most often we'll we'll get we'll hit a release window of about 30 days, um, and that that's pretty much the entire process. The next step in the process is it's handed off to the community, and um, and then James's James's the Ingress SIG and as well as other groups that are interested parties kind of take it from there. We're doing real good on, we're doing real good on time, so um, if you have questions while we go through this release process, um, just, just ask. Um, we got 15 minutes still, so I know we've got time for questions and things like that. So as I talk about this, if you don't know what the release process is or if there's something that's like, what is he talking about, um, just throw it out there. So the uh, Ingress, release pro Ingress Nginx release process, um, we have four stages of it and each one of them is a different PR and I've been talking and thinking about how we can change some of these because um, as I break things I'm learning new things about like um, there's a lot of GitOps folks out there that will automatically roll out a, uh, a patch release so that's fun to know. And if I accidentally release a breaking change on a patch because I didn't know breaking change was in there, I, I'll, I'll break things. So just learning and understanding, I need to be very um, aware of things that could go wrong. Maybe not as a huge of an impact as in a Nginx, but still, you can break a lot of clusters at once. You, you like breaking things, so. Yeah, well, you know, that's how I learn about it. <laughs> Nobody tells me they're using Ingress Nginx, so I only know when uh, people are using it when it's broken. Um, and what is it the best way to figure out who's using whatever rack thing you've got going on there is to pull the network cord and find yeah. it and wait for the emails to roll in? Exactly. Um, so one of the first steps, right, is that we, uh, we, we manage this with a tag file. The tag file gets updated. That's the uh, 170. That will uh, kick off a uh, Google Cloud build. So as a Kubernetes subproject, um, we build everything in the, uh, in the Kubernetes realm. So when you hear about uh, that, that G Cloud build, I don't know what percentage of Ingress Nginx uh, is responsible for that, but I know it takes a while to build um, Ingress. It takes us about, I think you'll see it in one of the uh, slides, it takes about if there's an uh, Nginx change or if there's a CVE remediation we've got to put out, it takes about four hours because we recompile Nginx from source. So that build could take four hours if, if it succeeds. So uh, is anybody using S390X, by the way? No? Oh, that's going on the deprecation list. I don't see any hands. So we build across uh, five or six different architectures, across four or five Kubernetes versions. Um, and then a lot of other things that I'll talk about in the later slide, but um, that all gets built in this first PR. So that gives us the container image for the new um, Nginx, either the Nginx or um, the controller. So all of our end-to-end -end tests, everything that we're running, we build on top of an Nginx base image. So if, I, if there's a change or a vulnerability in Nginx or any of the pieces that we're using, that's two container builds, so I have to build the Nginx container, I have to update all of our testing um, framework to use that new Nginx build, and then I can release a new controller. So um, I didn't even talk about that piece. That's a, that's a pre-PR for all of that. So that's kind of how things are built across that. So once I've got that new container build, um, SHA, um, since also we're a Kubernetes subproject, we also have to do image promotion. So the image promotion takes that from staging into the production. That's another PR for the uh, Kubernetes org. How many people knew that about those staging, about the promotions? Carlos, don't raise your hand. You know about that. You write the code for it, <laughs> shaking your head. <laughs> so in order for us to get that image out to you all, we have to do what's called the, the uh, promotion. So it's another PR, another piece of YAML. So that takes, uh, you know, 
anywhere from you know, one minute to you know, three or four hours, depending on if I have one of my maintainers available to accept that PR. Um, so that does the push, that does the prow build, that signs the container, that gets everything ready. That's the point where the, uh, the folks who do the patch releases, the GitOps folks, um, if it's available, they'll run it. And I haven't even done a release yet. So um, that's part of the release part that we're thinking about maybe changing, of doing the GitHub release and then doing this, this staging uh, promotion. That way it's not available for folks to try to use. But I'm wondering how many, how fast some of you are are going to yell at me that that image isn't available when I do a GitHub release. Or, or how fast is your automation in picking it up? So we're, we're working on trying to figure out how to optimize the build on trying not to break uh, things or making things available until we've actually officially announced them. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the one that, uh, that uh, recently has been automated. So all of those pieces are pieces of documentation. So updating the Helm chart, we have to update, update the Helm chart version. The Helm chart has its own versioning strategy because a, a configuration option for a Helm value could change, but the controller we're not updating. So um, we can release the Helm chart separately and independently, but with a new controller version, we have to do a, a version rev of the Helm change of the Helm chart. It also uh, requires updating the change log as well. So Helm, it's got its own release cycle, it's got its own change log, but also we have to update that as well. Um, and the version controller update. Uh, the change log update, we've been working really hard on uh, automating that as well. It was an artisanal note that took me about um, three or four hours to uh, handcraft and try to understand. Um, that's mostly automated now. Um, and then also the documentation update. I'm actually thinking about getting rid of that last piece, that documentation update, because really all it is is changing the version string in the examples to the current version. I'm just thinking about just putting it to main so I don't have to update that one. So just um, working through some of those thoughts. So that's the one that's uh, completely automated now from that perspective. But again, that's the third PR in, in this whole process. And then we've got that PR, we've got everything in, I tag the release, and I make an actual official GitHub release. That's the end part of the cycle of saying that there is a new release, here it is, but like I said, it's been available already for possibly a day, and there's no release note. So when people, uh, when things break or if something happens, it's like, guys, we haven't even released this yet, so can we not? Can we wait? So we've got to work on you know that timing and the communication. Um, part of that is uh, you know utilizing the uh, Kubernetes Dev mailing list more. Um, we actually have a very old Twitter handle that I'm getting the username and password for because uh, KubeCon is great for uh, tracking people down in person who's not answering your Slack DMs. <laughs> I know that because some of you do that to me, so I do that to others. So you know it's great to talk to people in person. So incidentally, that's that's. That's one more person than we currently have to, to work on the, the SIG right now. So, um, and I don't know who, who in this photo is who. Do I get to be Bomber? Uh, sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know who, I'm, who I would be. I'm, I'm just going to be awkwardly standing up there. I, I use all my energy at Kubioki. I apologize to all of you. But uh, that's, that, that is the high level of the change release process. And again, like I said, it's three GitHub PRs and a GitHub release. Um, only the one piece is automated right now, um, so that could take it. It could take anywhere from 30 minutes if we're on a Zoom call together and we want to get it out very quickly, to maybe taking a week because people aren't available, people are on vacation. We only have three maintainers who can approve that. One of them is in China, and the other one is also has a day job as well. So um, we're working um, with SIG Contributor X. Um, I did a couple workshops this week trying to understand how we can help build a community so we can take people who are one-time contributors to getting them to a reviewer to ultimately getting them to approvers so that we can help grow and get this to be a little, little bit faster. Um, we know that there is a backlog of PRs and issues. Um, one of the ways that you can make sure that you can get your PR um, push through or you get your issue talked about is coming to the community meeting. If you come to the community meeting, things get talked about, things get worked on, and they get pushed through. That's how we got the open telemetry module updated. Is anybody using the new open telemetry module? 
Did anybody know that you could use open telemetry now with Ingress Nginx? Thank you, one person, for validating how, me. How many people didn't know you could? <laughs> don't, don't do that to me. <laughs> so uh, part of that is on, is on the maintainers as well, is getting that information out there. Um, so trying to work on understanding how we can get more information out to the community. We have the two Slack um, mailing, we have the two Slacks um, channels. So we're just working on what's the best way to get this information out to folks. Um, I already talked about um, that, but uh, just want to. I'm going to click through this so folks can understand. I presented this at the last KubeCon. I just want to keep reiterating this to folks. There's a there's a lot that goes into Ingress Nginx that's just not Nginx or the configuration options. So if they're with GoLang, Alpine, Nginx, and Lua, if there's a patch that's needed in any one of those, or if there is. You know, when we do an Alpine update or a Golang update, a Go the Golang update is the same. We have to update all of our test runners so that we can actually compile it against that Golang version. So that's two more PRs, one to update the image and one to update the SHA for all of the testing. Same thing with Alpine, Nginx, um, and with Lua. So um, did anybody know that we have a kubectl plugin? Yeah? I got two, two, two. One's better than two, so getting there. Um, so the kubectl plugin, that's also something that we have to maintain. We've worked on automating that as well, and we fixed it. Um, the, the whole Mac um, switch and architectures helped fix that and shed light that we weren't actually releasing new kubectl plugins. <laughs> so again, just learning new things. I think I've been doing, I've been helping maintain the project for, oh wow, two, three years now, and I'm still learning new things about it, so trying to lower that curve for new people, that learning curve for new folks. Um, two monitoring frameworks, that's gonna go down to one once we deprecate those and push everyone to using the open telemetry module, so not going to do that until everyone knows that the open telemetry module is available, so thank you for that data point. Um, third party plugins, so um, from a Lua perspective, you, if you need a Lua module or if you need, I uh, forget, I, don't know the plugins off the top of my head, so we help ma maintain three of those. There's a four hour build time if there's an Nginx change. So there's just a lot that goes in. So the any changes in those Nginx modules um, that we use or if someone requests a new one, um, and I'm not even gonna talk about that number, the, the depths. Command line flag, so there's just there's a lot with the 400 end-to-end -end tests. Our end-to-end -end tests across those Kubernetes versions, and now with LTS, we're gonna have to do N minus five. Um, it takes about 50 minutes to run an end-to-end -end test, um, and that's going to be on every PR. So it's uh, not, a, not a small process. If you have any questions, um, please let us know. This is the uh, QR code for the feedback. Uh, let us know how it went. We've got the links. This I haven't uploaded this yet, um, but I'll, I'll tweet this out. I'll put it in the Slack user channel, um, the Slack dev channel and try to get it out there. But um, we have a dev channel where we talk about the release process, PRs that we want to work on, things that um, the maintainers um, need to work through. And then we have the user support. How many people ask questions in user support knows that it exists? OK. I'm not getting a lot of hands up. How many of you use Ingress Nginx? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm really glad that, that it's, I'm sad, but I'm glad that we're having this conversation that about all of this stuff and how this stuff works, because um, I, I figured that was the case. A lot of people use it, but they don't understand how the, uh, how the sausage is made. So when, when you guys go looking for new features and updates to Ingress and GenX, where do you look? Just in the release notes? OK. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, we have new. We have a new contributor doc, but uh, I think it needs work. I mean, it always needs work. Our docs always need work. Um, we meet every Thursday at 11 Eastern. Um, we've been trying to think about and move about the times, but you know, it, it's hard because it's the middle of the day and everyone's working. And if you want to talk, uh, if you want to see about uh, what we do talk about and the meetings, um, community meeting playlist is out there as well. Um, Right on time, I guess. Any questions? If you have a question about a PR, just no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What's up? So you mentioned the build time is like four hours. So does 
Yes. So the question was, uh, I mentioned the four hour build time. Does that include tests as well? Uh, no. That's, that's compiling, so I'll go back. That's, when I say four hours, so we, because we use Lua modules and a bunch of Nginx modules, we have to compile Nginx from source. We can't just use the Nginx binary. So that's the four hour build time. And that's, that's across the, f how many? The four architectures, and that's why I asked the question. Because usually, when S390 fails, it fails the whole build, and that's really annoying. That's, so that's why I asked this S390 question. So yeah, it's not the testing. So we build that, and then we do our integration testing with that new one. <coughs> so that's why, it, build a new Nginx image, we do a pull request to update our end-to-end -end testing to use that new Nginx version, and then we can do the testing. So it's three PRs before we can even start testing it. We're uh, working on optimizing that, but again, it's optimizing the release process, communication, or lack thereof, and also you know, working through the PRs and managing all of the other things. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. So that's why I made the joke before we start recording and asking folks um, that you know, we need contributors to help, and I need to do, we need to do a better job as the maintainers to make, lower that bar, barrier of entry so we can get people to approvers. And uh, Dylan, th this one's for you, so. That, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, there you go. But anyway. But, so. By the way, that's a real ax, 100%. Yeah, I couldn't bring what it. did you say, you can kill people with it or something <laughs> like that? No, <laughs> no, I would not. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming. I don't, were we, were we 35? I can't remember. Anyway, if you have any more questions, let me know. We're hanging out um, at the Changar booth and at the Nginx booth.